a reading from the Acts of the Apostles. <clears throat> the church throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria was at peace. She was being built up and walked in the fear of the Lord. And with the consolation of the Holy Spirit, she grew in numbers. As Peter was passing through every region, he went down into the Holy Ones living in Lydda. There he found a man named Aeneas, who had been confined to bed for eight years, for he was paralyzed. Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and make your bed. He got up at once, and all the inhabitants of Lydda and Sharon saw him, and they turned to the Lord. Now in Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha, which translated as Dorcas. She was completely occupied with good deeds and almsgiving. Now during those days, she fell sick and died. So after washing her, they laid her out in a room upstairs. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples, hearing that Peter was there, sent two men to him with the request, please come to us without delay. So Peter got up and went with them. When he arrived, they took him into the room upstairs where all the widows came to him weeping and showing him the tunics and clocks, cloaks that Dorcas had made while she was with them. Peter sent them all out and knelt down and prayed. Then he turned to her body and said, Tabitha, rise up. She opened her eyes, saw Peter, and sat up. He gave her his hand and raised her up. And when he had called the ones, the holy ones and the widows, he presented her alive. This became known all over Joppa, and many came to believe in the Lord. The word of the Lord. <clears throat> How shall I make a return to the Lord for all the good he has done for me? How shall I make a return to the Lord for all the good he has done for me? The cup of salvation I will take up, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. My vows to the Lord I will pay in the presence of all his people. Precious in the eyes of the Lord is the death of his faithful ones. O oh Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your handmaid. You have loosed my bonds. To you I will offer sacrifice of thanksgiving, and I will call upon the name of the Lord.
Dominus vobiscum. Et Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Ioanne. Many of the disciples of Jesus who were listening said, This saying is hard. Who can accept it? Since Jesus knew that his disciples were murmuring about this, he said to them, Does this shock you? What if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life, while the flesh is of no avail. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. Jesus knew from the beginning the ones who would believe and the one who would betray him. And he said, for this reason, I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by my Father. As a result of this, many of his disciples returned to their former way of life and no longer walked with him. Jesus then said to the 12, do you also want to leave? Simon Peter answered him, Master, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and are convinced that you are the Holy One of God. Bebum Domini. Today we remember Mother Angelica in a special way as we observe what would have been her 101st birthday. And so we pray for the repose of her soul and for the many people she had reached throughout her life and who she continues to reach through the network she founded. And we will have special intercessions today as well as a televised rosary following the mass at 8 a.m. Central and 9 a.m. Eastern featuring meditations written by Mother Angelica. And so please join us if you can. Every day throughout the past week, the gospel reading has been taken from John chapter six, which is commonly known as the Bread of Life Discourse. And the chapter opens with Jesus's miraculous feeding of 5,000 people with five barley loaves and two fish. And this naturally makes Jesus so popular with the crowd that many of them pursue him across the Sea of Galilee to Capernaum. Jesus knows that these people are following him for purely material reasons and wish to make him an earthly king. And while Jesus is indeed a king, his kingdom is not of this world. He thus prepares the disciples who have stayed with him to receive his most challenging teaching yet. He tells them that he is the living bread come down from heaven and that the bread he will give for the life of the world is his flesh. And when the people quarrel among themselves over this teaching, Jesus only doubles down and even says even more emphatically, amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day. It is undeniable that Jesus is using graphic, vivid language that is understood by his listeners in a literal sense. They cannot wrap their minds around the concept of Jesus' flesh conferring everlasting life. And in today's reading, the disciples who are really struggling with this teaching say among themselves, this saying is hard. Who can accept it? When Jesus sees their difficulty, he does not launch into an explanation of how eating his flesh is really meant in a symbolic way. Rather, Jesus asks them some questions that challenge these disciples towards the ascent of faith. And this is the crux of the matter with respect to the disciples who murmur about Jesus' teaching on the Eucharist. They understand all too well that Jesus means what he says about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. 
The problem is that their lack of faith prevents them from accepting this teaching as well. They were willing to believe in Jesus so long as he was providing them with material bread to fulfill their natural hunger. But when he calls them to place their supernatural trust in him, they are unwilling to do so. They cannot bring themselves to acknowledge Jesus' divinity, even though he has performed miraculous signs that point to his identity. Jesus tries to bring these disciples to the, point of, to the point of making an act of faith, but he cannot force them to believe. He can lead a horse to water, but he can't make it drink. And these are, there are some, some people who claim that Jesus' words in verse 63 negate any Eucharistic understanding of what has preceded it. Verse 63 says, it is the spirit that gives life, while the flesh is of no avail. And there are some who will point to this verse and say that Jesus was only speaking symbolically about his flesh, since he is saying that it is of no avail. And this was the interpretation of the Protestant reformer Zwingli, who rejected a sacramental Eucharistic interpretation of this passage. But on the contrary, this verse does not negate Jesus' previous teaching about eating his flesh and drinking his blood. When Jesus says the flesh is of no avail, he's referring to human flesh in a general sense, which indeed has no power in itself to confer eternal life upon the one who consumes it. It is only when the sacred flesh of Christ is infused with the Holy Spirit that it conveys eternal life. So the flesh is the vessel through which the life of God is communicated to the soul of the recipient. We receive the flesh of Christ crucified and risen, not in a piecemeal physical form, but in the sacramental form of the Holy Eucharist. And hence the problem with those disciples who murmur against this teaching is with their lack of faith in Jesus' words. Jesus says to them, the words I have spoken to you are spirit and life, but there are some of you who do not believe. So faith is a necessary component in the doctrine of the Holy Eucharist. In fact, the grace of Holy Communion is only accessible to those who have faith in Jesus' words. Jesus calls us to believe, but he does not force us to do so. We must give the assent of faith willingly. And sadly, the disciples who do not believe turn back to their former way of life and no longer walk with Jesus. Even though they have witnessed something truly magnificent with the feeding of the 5,000, the teaching on the Eucharist is a bridge too far for them. And as many of the disciples leave Jesus behind, our Lord, Lord turns to the remaining disciples, the 12 apostles, and asks them, do you also want to leave? And this is the question that Jesus poses to all of us disciples. And hopefully we will all respond like Peter and say, Master, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Even if the apostles had not fully understood Jesus' words, and I guarantee you they didn't fully understand what Jesus was saying, they simply learned to trust him and to follow him. The church's doctrine on the Eucharist is indeed a difficult teaching. It is something that can only be accepted on faith, which is a gift from God. The Eucharist was never meant to be a source of division, but rather a principle of unity. But unfortunately, the potential for division has been there since the beginning. As the Catechism says in paragraph 1336, the first announcement of the Eucharist divided the disciples, just as the announcement of the Passion scandalized them. This is a hard saying, who can listen to it? The Eucharist and the cross are stumbling blocks. It is the same mystery, and it never ceases to be an occasion of division. Will you also go away? 
The Lord's question echoes through the ages as a loving invitation to discover that only he has the words of eternal life and that to receive in faith the gift of his Eucharist is to receive the Lord himself. Those who receive the Eucharist in faith follow in the footsteps of the remaining apostles who believed in the Lord. And so the Eucharist is part of the apostolic faith of the church. And so it is our hope and our prayer as Catholics that all Christians will be united once again in the Eucharistic celebration, one Eucharistic celebration. And while we should remain firm and steadfast in our belief in the real presence of our Lord in the Holy Eucharist, we should be kind, patient, and loving towards our non-Catholic Christian brothers and sisters who do not acknowledge the Eucharist, who have trouble giving the assent of faith to the Eucharist. While they might lack participation in full communion with us, we at least share a common faith in and love for Jesus Christ. It is through our charitable engagement with them that we will all hopefully be brought closer together according to the will of God. And regarding the Eucharist and the unity of Christians, the Catechism says in paragraph 1398, before the greatness of this mystery, St. Augustine exclaims, O sacrament of devotion, O sign of unity, O bond of charity. The more painful the experience of the divisions in the church, which break the common participation in the table of the Lord, the more urgent are our prayers to the Lord that the time of complete unity among all who believe in him may return.